I disagree with many of Justin's fundamental assumptions about how we perceive, act, and think in the world, so our approaches to learning science differ, but he recently said, I think Obsidian is a really good app for second brain management. Yeah. But second brain management is, is used as a reference tool. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. a reference mm -hmm. software. It's not for primary encoding. And obviously being an Obsidian user, I want to discuss the ideas that were mentioned in this video about Zettelkasten, the second brain, and of course, Obsidian as a note-taking tool. For Zettelkasten and second brain, to give you some context, this is what they were saying. I usually use Obsidian. Obsidian is like the place where I have my most notes. I first tried to do Zettelkasten. I couldn't retrieve anything I because I had so many notes and because uh, Zettelkasten like, didn't work for me in the fact that my brain couldn't like remember what exact combination of words I used to retrieve a note or something. Now for me there are a couple of things in there. First, Zettelkasten. What Zettelkasten is and the ideas about what it is are two different things because from my understanding Zettelkasten is a note box. It's a collection of notes, ideally, that are linked. So anything that is a folder system that has files in that can be linked, which is anything on your computer or Obsidian or any note-taking or writing app really could be a Zettelkasten system. It doesn't have to be what they were talking about in the video. And this is where I think the discussions about the frameworks and techniques of what Zettelkasten is confuses the, the lines a bit here because you now have atomic notes, which are small notes, which is used with Zettelkasten, but they're not the same thing. They're two separate ideas and concepts. And if we look at the idea of an atomic note or a smart note or whatever jargon term you want to put on there, how, how small is it? Is it done by letters? Is it done by paragraphs or sentences or points or ideas or concepts? There's, there's no way to measure what an atomic note or a large note is. It's just a file or a note with information in. So when I hear them struggling to be able to find the information, that for me is where they have too many small notes or atomic notes that aren't specific enough to what it is they're working on. If they're working on something, then why would you separate all of those parts out into small notes? To me, that's redundant, which is why I have one big file on a concept rather than lots of small files. That's my preference. Maybe by the sounds of it, it doesn't work for them to separate things, so you put it all into one file that you can find, make it searchable. And to me, that affordance is what the issue is here. It's the searchability of the vault, of the files, of the folders, of the notes. How do you go and find those things? So you can rename the file, you can search for headings rather than just the files, you can search for words inside of the files rather than the names of the files, and then when you're naming the files, how are you doing it? Is it something that you know then and there, or is it something you're likely to remember bit in the future and something that I do is when I go and search for something and I don't find it off of the first search result it's because what I'm thinking about then isn't related to what I named it so I rename it to something that I searched for initially say I'm thinking about cognitive load theory but when I initially named it it's Sweller's theory well I typed in cognitive load theory and I found it under Sweller's theory so I just renamed the file to cognitive load theory because that's what I'm searching for which means Zettelkasten isn't the problem they're not doing it wrong or right it's just what they're currently doing with their current practice isn't working for them so you change the practice change the way that you name the files or link the files or condense files whatever it is that you're doing with the files inside of obsidian or whatever app you're using and for clarification the second brain idea concept comes from extended cognition i spoke to tiago forte about this a while back and the second brain isn't an app it's not a tool it's a toolkit and there are lots of things involved in that and there are lots of processes involved in extended cognition the idea the concept around the second brain. So calling Obsidian or Rome or Notion or Evernote or whatever app it is your second brain isn't accurate because it's all of the different tools that you're using. That could be pen, paper, iPad, the computer, your phone, like everything involved in cognition that isn't in your brain is therefore extended, which is in part of your second brain. And the reason this distinction is important because of where the theory comes from and how you apply it in practice is because of this comment that Justin says. But the reason that physical tends to be better is not necessarily because there's anything wrong with digital. Really? Yep. It's probably because the tools that are designed are not cognitively optimizing enough. Yeah. So there are some advantages with being able to do things physically. But what does that mean, cognitively optimizing? If we are talking about the second brain and the concept of extended cognition, that includes everything that comes outside of your brain, or that is outside of your brain, which includes the tools, obsidian, phone, etc, etc. But that depends on your personal mark of the cognitive. What does it mean to be involved in cognition? Is that embedded, embodied, enacted? There's lots of different versions of it. 
I could then go and talk loads about philosophy and psychology and all the different academic differences between the approaches, but the point Justin makes about digital not being cognitively optimizing for me is about the skill of the individual. If someone is skilled at using a digital tool to help them learn, they are more likely to get benefits from it than someone that isn't skilled. So to me, this comes down to the abilities of the individual rather than the tool itself. Some people are more skilled with one tool over another tool, and there are preferences between one tool over another tool, whether it's analog or digital, but at the end of the day, it comes down to the skill of the individual. Some professional writers use old-fashioned typewriters, but their skill of writing with old-fashioned typewriters is what puts them up. Some do it digitally, and it puts them up. It's not that they are better writers with those tools, it's the relationship between the individual and the environment and their skill in that, the skills they've developed in that environment, whether it be be a hard piece of paper or an actual digital tool, which changes the focus from what tool are you using, what technique are you using, what framework do you have, to how are you practicing, what are you doing? In this specific video, they don't discuss how they're doing anything, it's just very high level concepts and ideas and theories, but they do mention this. And I think it's the, it's the same sort of thing is that, yes, you can create a relationship. Yes, you can tag the information. And yes, technically it's organized, but it's organized in the software. It doesn't mean that it's actually yeah. organized in your brain. Organized in the software, but what, what does that mean, organized? If you've written something on a piece of paper, there is organization to it. If you've written it in a digital tool, there's organization to it. If you then scribble something out and then draw an arrow, that's reorganizing the information. You can move lines down, move lines up. You can actually draw connections and make links inside of different apps, which again is reorganizing information. So what does organized in the software mean? And also what does organized in the brain mean? We can't take something out of our brain and say, okay, that bit's organized, that bit's not. We, we don't have the technology to do that. All we can do is measure brain activation, but we don't have any specifics on information. So that's where the science again is lacking. And the claim about being organized in the brain to me is what he's referring to his expertise someone's skill development in being able to use specific pieces of information and ways to use that information to do whatever it is they want to do the goal essentially the reason this is important is because is it organized is it a snapshot is it okay do you have that in your brain now well yes if you're working with it at some point it has been organized but does it stay there well that's the question and that's not organization that's the ability to remember. How are you remembering those pieces of information when it's appropriate, when doing whatever skill it is? So now it's not, is it stored or is it organized? It's how are you remembering that? And so when we look at practice design and adding constraints into the relationship we have with, whether it's an analog tool or a digital tool, what can we do? They mentioned you've got tags, you've got headers, you've got paragraphs, you've got blocks in some tools, you've got files, you've got folders. There's lots of different ways to constrain or afford opportunities for behavior for remembering information. Maybe you tag everything, maybe you put everything specifically under a header, or you have a file about that narrative or that story. And this then leads to how you start start learning with that information because you're remembering information related to what? And there are the links. Is that related to a past project or a past experience more specifically? And talking about remembering and practice design, Justin goes on to say. The second thing is that a big, big part, in fact, probably 80 to 90% of the learning process when you're learning new information is just hypothesizing structures, rewriting them and like redoing it and trying to make that make that fit. Yeah. It's not as easy to do that when you're committing it to a software, because often when you're creating the note, it actually creates the record of it. And then so it's hard mm. to actually then just delete it. And for me, I'm just going to say it quite bluntly, but I think that's just rubbish. You have the backspace, you have the delete button, you have the hotkeys. If anything, it's easier to delete things and scratch pad things on digital devices than on paper, because on paper, when you scribble things out, you can still see it. Digital, you just delete it and it's gone. But on digital, you have a history. On a paper, you don't. Once you've rubbed something out or you've scribbled it out so you can't read it, in the future, if you do want to know what that was, you can't remember it. Digital, you can, which gives the digital the advantage of being able to scratch pad ideas. And for me personally, when it comes to rewriting things, if I'm going to rewrite something, I will just rewrite the same sentence three, four, five, however many times underneath one another so I can compare them, then I can move them up and down easily with my keyboard and then remove ones that I don't want. On paper, that's not as easy to do. And when you do start drawing arrows, it becomes very messy, which is why I personally use digital. Tool. Of course, it does work in analog, but this argument just seems really poor. 
The third thing is that there are many more ways of representing information uh, freehand than there is usually by software. And if it is possible with software, there's so many clicks that it takes to be able to do that. Now, this one I think is narrow thinking or narrow minded, whether that's deliberate or not, I'm not sure, but they're talking specifically or Justin's talking specifically about mind mapping and drawing on the page or whatever it is, which you can do in Obsidian. There's a plugin called Excaladraw. Is it good or not? That's down to each individual, but it's still possible to handwrite in Obsidian. So saying Obsidian can't do this, I think is flawed. There is also the default core plugin for the canvas, which does let you link things together, not as free form as handwriting, admittedly. But when it comes to linking ideas and making things specific in how they're related, you don't need to draw arrows or handwrite things because it's writing. At the end of the day, it's writing. And to make things specific, it's easier to make it explicit through words. This is linked because of this. This relates to this because of that. I think this because of this. An arrow, a dotted arrow, a lined arrow, a colored arrow can mean, okay, this is related to this, but it's implicit that there's no explicit information about why they are linked. You need to be able to remember that. Maybe that's a deliberate choice by learning design, but I would argue in a year's time when you see a diagram and you have an arrow, you won't know the meaning behind that arrow back then unless it's written somewhere or you're constantly practicing that meaning over and over, in which case the arrow is somewhat redundant because you have practiced it so much that it's just there. So using a practical example, if I was to draw a mind map on cognitive load theory, I'm not going to draw an arrow to John Sweller because I know John Sweller and cognitive load theory are explicitly related, like the guy came up with the theory, or at least heavily developed it because I know other researchers were involved. And I think this disagreement is because of our different approaches to the way that we learn and his ideas around mind mapping. Um, and then the final benefit is that it's much easier to do visual anchoring, which is to mm -hmm. visually make a certain concept appear more important and have maybe imagery involved in it to actually create like a little memory landmark that our brain is going to find easier to, to hold on to. So for example, I could have like a, right? So now yeah. that becomes a visual you know, landmark. And now, as someone familiar with the literature, it's really interesting that he uses the word visual because it's all visual, like a word on a screen, a font, bold, all of that is still visual. An image, yes, is visual, but so is all the other words that we write. So writing is a visual anchor. It can be a visual anchor. A heading is different from a heading two or a heading six or text on a screen or something that's been highlighted. There are visual anchors with text. You don't need an image for that. So assuming visual anchors can only be images because that's what they're discussing, why do you need an image to display specific pieces of information? Because an image, as I'm sure you're familiar with, says a thousand words. Well, when you come back to it, those thousand words. If you're looking for something in specific, how does that help you? If you have a picture of a mountain, how does a picture of a mountain help you with specific information on whatever the topic is, apart from, hey, there's a mountain, it could mean any of these thousand things. This to me is where the full context of the work comes into play. It's not the image itself that's the visual anchor. It's the image with the words in the file, with all the other words around it, with your prior knowledge, however you want to define that, and the information you're working at that time because in the future or in the past, you will have interpreted that information, assuming cognitive psychology with interpretations, you will have interpreted that information differently. So the mind mapping that Obsidian doesn't do well can be done with the visual anchors through headings, through files, through projects, and through various other mediums that Obsidian and other note-taking tools do. I know I'm talking about Obsidian here, but any type, Notion, Roam, all of those tools, even Word, has those options. For me, learning is about our practice design and our experiences in practice. Repetition without repetition. So rewriting passages, writing different narratives about the same concepts, same ideas, do it in different ways, maybe a presentation, talking to yourself, talking to other people, conversations online, whether it's in Discord or on YouTube, or whatever it is, have varying experiences, repetition without repetition, of concepts to help you understand and connect different ideas for remembering whatever information it is that you're trying to remember. And this all leads to one of the more frustrating comments I heard inside of this video. I think Obsidian is a really good app for second brain management. Yeah. But second brain management is, is used as a reference tool. Mm -hmm. It's a mm -hmm. reference software. It's not for primary encoding. 
Mm -mm, no. And so yeah. it's a completely different way. So if we pick that apart, second brain, it's second brain storage. No, there's more to it than that. If you read the book or followed Tiago Forte in any real way, you'll know that it's code, C-O-D-E, capture, organize, distill, express. So referencing is the organized bit. What about the capturing? Well, capturing, yeah, you could argue it's referencing, but it's also capturing various pieces of information, which could be multimodal. So conversations or audio or visual which is mind maps which is what he's talking about then there is the distill section which is the writing the processing however you want to define processing but it's the writing it's working with information which can be mind mapping which is what he's talking about and obsidian can do mind mapping with excalibur or, or with visual anchoring and whatever it is that you're doing with the writing tool whether it's loads of headings small headings small files big files there's lots of different ways to distill information and then Expressing the information again can be done in lots of different ways in various tools, not just Obsidian. So the second brain isn't Obsidian app. It's process of thinking outside of the brain, extended cognition. And when it comes to reference tools, there are reference managers. EndNote, I personally use Zotero for a library of references. So Obsidian could be that, but I use Zotero, or you could use Word or Apple Notes or anything that you have a list of files so it, that that's just not accurate to what a reference manager is or could be now when it comes to the primary encoding because we have fundamentally different assumptions on how we perceive act and think in the world encoding for me is just a redundant term in this context but encoding assumes that we're storing something to memory and that is it that that's the memory models in cognitive psychology there's loads of them long-term memory working memory short-term memory long-term working memory and all the other variations but the primary encoding includes how to remember things so how you're remembering things how you're learning things how you're forgetting things as well because primary encoding in this context is about learning and all of that is part of the second brain building a second brain it's linking relinking diverging converging on ideas and that to me second brain being extended cognition is about cognition which is thinking so can obsidian be a tool for thinking yes and so can literally any other tool so when you say it's not for primary encoding it's not for learning is, is i think the argument he's trying to make which i fundamentally disagree with because every writing tool every thinker has used a writing tool in the past whether it is a piece of paper or a digital piece of paper or a whiteboard or anything it's writing it's writing symbols and words and using those symbols and words to help you think in whatever direction or dimension that you want to so arguing that obsidian isn't for primary encoding i think is trying to argue obsidian isn't for thinking and learning which I think is just wrong. Of course, I could be misunderstanding things. If I am, let me know in the comment section below and we can have a discussion about it. But when you say something like Obsidian is for second brain reference managing tool and not for primary encoding, I really worry about what that sends to individuals that want to use writing tools for thinking. I've recently started a series on this channel where I show you how exactly it is that I'm working my practice and practice design. I'll leave the most recent video here. I think that one was a bit too complicated for beginners, but there it is.